Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi taala wabarakatuh and very good afternoon. On behalf of University Technology Malaysia, I would like to welcome all viewers to the 109th professorial inaugural lecture series that will be delivered by our respected speaker, Professor Dr. Naomi binti Salim from School of Computing, Faculty of Engineering UTM. We bring to you a very interesting lecture today entitled 
Turning data into insights, challenges and promises of mining gold from data. I am Anazida Zainal, your MC for today's program from School of Computing as well. First and foremost, we thank Allah the Almighty for this opportunity. Let's begin with Surah Al-Fatiha as we seek for His Rahmah and blessings for our program that all of us will get benefits from it. Al-Fatiha. Uh, before we proceed further, I would like to remind viewers that we will pin the link for the attendance form in the FB and also YouTube comment. Uh, besides, we will also pin another link to a Google form. So for those who wish to collaborate and take part in validating our Adiba framework, later it will be covered by Prof. Naomi, or wish to use Adiba or even students who are keen to be part of our team, you can fill in the form. We will contact you soon. Without further delay, I would like to invite the Honourable Chairman, Professor T.S. Dr. Rose Alinda Binti Alias from Azman Hashim International Business School to give her opening remarks and biosketch recital. Over to you, Prof. Rose. Thank you Thank very, you. very much, dear Dr. Anazida, our MC for today. I was delighted to accept Professor Naomi's request for me to chair the session and recite her biodata at this most auspicious occasion for a professor. We saw snippets of Naomi's personal life just now, and so let us get to know more of Naomi, the person, before we hear about Naomi, the professor. So who is Naomi? So Naomi is actually a local girl, a Skudai girl born on 13th of August, 1966, just a few kilometers from UTM. Her father is Haji Salim Sadi, an electrical technician with Singapore PUBW in Skudai, and her mother is Haja Kalsum Tik, a housewife who sold ladies' clothes as a side income. And Naomi is the eldest to two younger brothers, Nihan and Nizal, the typical Katlong, just like me. And I think she's a Katlong to so many of us uh, in UTM. So, as is shown in her CV and in her track record. She has been scoring all A's and being tops in all of the classes that she has attended, starting with the primary school assessment, standard five assessment, which, of, which then enabled her to be offered a place at Sekolah Ton Fatimah Johor Bahru. I have to mention that, otherwise all the Sri Kandis will chase after me. They claim that they are the top boarding school for girls in Malaysia. So being a TKC and yeah, Rosni, <laughs> we will say that TKC is the top school in Malaysia for girls. But Ton Fatima is the top boarding school for girls in Johor. And not surprisingly, Naomi scored all A's for her SPM, which then led her to UTM, studying computer science sponsored by Texas Instruments Malaysia. And typical to form, Naomi was awarded the Tunku Abdul Rahman Gold Medal and the Wanita Amno Gold Medal for her performance during undergraduate studies. So that was how I got to know Naomi. She's the gold medal girl. And of course, she was very active also in the Persatuan Science Computer, which is the UTM Student Council, also MPP, and also the Deputy Director for, for the UTM Orientation Week in 1988. So I first met Naomi when she registered as an assistant lecturer A at Institute Science Computer UTM on her, I'm going to mention this, on her 23rd birthday. I think I got it right. 13th of August 1989, just 10 days after my transfer from, UT, from ITM Shah Alam to UTM. And then in 1990, she went to United States of America to do her Master's of Science in Computer Science at the top computer science school, which is University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign in USA. And on a personal note, let me share this because I attended the wedding. <laughs> in 1990, she married her one-year senior at university 
Allah Yarham Abdul Khalim Haji Abdul Kadi. I think we saw the pictures just now, who was also a lecturer at the faculty and they were blessed with a daughter, Nadira Abdul Kalim, who is also my Facebook friend. <laughs> and after she got married to this undergraduate sweetheart, she transferred to Western Michigan University, Kalamazoo, USA in 1991 and uh, graduated with Masters in Computer Science from Western Michigan University in 1992. But I will never forget the news that I heard from Malaysia when I, I have to mention this because it brought such sadness to me. It still makes me very sad today uh, when I heard the news uh, about uh, Abdul Halim being killed in a road accident at the North South Highway near Senawang. So Naomi became a single mother for 17 years. She is the most strongest person that I know. I have to declare that. Apologies for being emotional, but I have to give her that recognition for being the single mother that she was for 17 years until she married in 2010 to YB Amino Huda and ends up being a mother of five children. So Naomi's track record in UTM, UTM is very long. She reflects the whole DNA of UTM, what UTM is all about. When we talk about ISAS, integrity, synergy, excellence, sustainability, Who's the icon for me? Naomi represents that person. She has held so many administrative positions, but she started off with a post that was uh, under me when she was the uh, head of the data. She was the postgraduate studies coordinator. Uh, and then she succeeded me as the deputy dean for the FSKSM, Faculty of Computer Science and Information Systems, in 2011. And I must mention she also passed, pursued her PhD and got her PhD at University of Sheffield, UK under the supervision of none other, Professor Peter Willard and Dr. John Holliday, because that is very much related to the scholar that she has become today. I must also mention that Naomi passed her viva without correction, <laughs> is no correction, graduated on time for PhD in 2003. So Naomi is currently the Deputy Dean for Research and Innovation at the Faculty of Engineering since 2018. So I think we will see the slides that shows her accomplishments as a scholar. It's all there on the slide. She was awarded the Top Research Scientist Malaysia in 2020 by the Academy of Science Malaysia. She was also one of the three finalists of the 2016 ICT Researcher of the Year awarded by the SEARCC, the Forum of National IT Professional Societies in Asia-Pacific Region. Talk about research. Naomi is the exemplar of ICT research, being involved in 55 research projects, total amount of more than 4.5 million. She's also the principal in this investigator of 31 research pro uh, projects and has published more than 400 scientific papers with 300 of it under the Web of Science and Scopus. So not surprisingly, she has a very, very good, a much, much higher high in H index than me, which is H index of 23. And she has actually incorporated most of her research into various number of uh, software uh, systems that is being used for multiple purposes. I think we will hear more of that. Uh, shortly, uh, but the latest, uh, and there's, I think, too many awards, as you can see on the slot that she has received, but the latest uh, being that she has been given to head the Malaysia Big Data Research Consortium under the Ministry of Higher Education. I must mention also that Naomi has graduated 43, 43 PhD students under her supervision and her innovation in big data, data warehousing and mobile applications has benefited many, many industries such as Johor Corp, Malaysia Marine and Heavy Engineering, Mohe of course, and also the SSM amongst others. So I am just so in awe of Naomi. That's why when she asked me, I said, yes, I would feel so proud to read Naomi's accomplishment and we look forward to hear what she has to share 
on the topic which is related to her expertise today. So back to you again, Dr. Anazida, to welcome uh, Professor Naomi. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Alhamdulillah. Thank you, Prof. Rose, uh, for the astounding opening. Uh, to viewers, we will uh, we welcome any questions and kindly put your questions in the comment area in YouTube or Facebook before I call Prof. Naomi. So, um, uh, so please do so if you have any questions, even during the, le the lecture. Okay, so now without further ado, I would like to invite Prof. Naomi to deliver the professorial inaugural lecture. Over to you, Prof. Naomi. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh and a very good afternoon to everyone. I would like to thank you for taking your time to come to my lecture this afternoon. The title of my lecture today is Turning Data into Insights, Challenges and Promises of Mining Gold from Data. Before I start my lecture, I would like to also thank three wonderful ladies for helping me out in this lecture. Associate Professor Dr. Anazida Zaina, thank you for being the MC for today's lecture. Professor Dr. Rose Alinda Alias, our ex-Deputy Vice Chancellor of Academic and International Internationalization, and she is also currently the Secretary General for Academy of Professor Malaysia, and also Professor Dr. Rosni Abdullah, who was the ex-dean of School of Computer Science in our Apex University, University Science Malaysia. Thank you all, and thank you all for making this happen. Okay, my lecture today is on data. What is so important about data? Data is important because everything that exists in the world, everything that happened in the world can be represented using data. From the smallest thing, like the DNA in the nucleus of cells that make up all living things, to atoms and molecules, to whatever happened in the world and in the universe can be represented using data. Now, if we can collect this data and analyze it effectively, we can understand more about what is happening. We can understand why it happens. We can predict what is going to happen in the future. And in fact, we can ask the computer to recommend the best course of action that we will take so that we can have the outcome we desire. So the whole world is actually one big data problem. I've had a long-term relationship with data starting from network databases, hierarchical databases, and relational databases, and also file processing in my undergraduate years, to extended relational databases and object-oriented databases during my master's in computer science years, to content-based information retrieval, where we can retrieve whatever is in our repository based on the content of the data we have at hand, to chemical databases and biological databases during my PhD years. And I've been teaching several databases course, not only the fundamental databases course, such as database systems, database uh, programming languages, database administration, but also advanced databases such as semi-structured databases where the structure of the data is not stable and consistent and we have to keep schema inside the data. Extended relational databases and object-oriented databases where the data encapsulate the procedure and have far more sophisticated um, structure to represent the data, not only relations in the relational databases. Unstructured databases, text databases, spatial temporal databases, images, video, audio, and so on. And during my uh, tenure, yeah. during my time as the Japan Society for Promotion of Science Fellow in Japan, I learned also about deep learning. I was very lucky to have been taught by people who are very prominent in database. 
Professor Marian Wislet from University of Illinois about the champion. She is the deputy chair for ACM Sigmod, editors to many renowned database journals such as ACM Transactions on Database Systems, IEEE Transactions on Knowledge and Data Engineering, among others. So she is very inspirational and she has actually sparked my interest in database. And I was also lucky to be supervised by Professor Peter Willett. Yeah, who have written books on IR and text analytics and is considered one of the fathers of scan informatics. So these people influence a lot of my work and a lot of my teaching and learning activities in the universities. So much of my work is actually influenced by this exposure and experience. So this is the outline of my talk today. First, I'm going to cover about big data. Why should we care about big data? And then the promises of big data analytics now and in the future. And also I'm going to touch about big data, big data analytics challenges and what research in UTM that we have done to tackle these challenges. And I'm also going to explain about Adiba. For the first time, I'm going to I'm going to discuss and I'm going to introduce the Adiba Big Data Adoption and Implementation Framework in public with the hope that organizations can use this process framework to help them adopt and implement big data analytics in their organizations. So what is big data and why should we care? Companies around the world are embracing digital transformation where they use ICT and related technologies to change the way they operate, to change the way they serve their customers, analyze their world and manage rates. Yeah? And at the heart of this digital transformation is data. So every decision that we make, either as individuals, as organizations, as a society, is actually an uncertain probabilistic gamble based on some kind of prior information. So if we can improve the structure of this prior information on which we base our estimates, then our uncertainty will be reduced and we can get better decision. The big data analytics paradigm offers a vast variety of new kinds of priors and estimation techniques to inform all sorts of decisions. Yeah? So that gives us a chance to make better decisions. If we talk about fourth industrial revolution, Big data and advanced analytics are two of the main important components in fourth industrial revolution. And if you look at new business model nowadays, yeah, a big chunk of the new business model is from data-driven business model, where we get direct monetization from the collected data instead of the primary product. For example, Google and Facebook, they never charge us to use Google and Facebook, yeah, but they get a lot of money from the data they collected. And also we can get a lot of indirect monetization of insights from collected data. For example, if we analyze the collected data of people who search Google, yeah, of people's expenditure and so on, we can do micro segmentation for pricing so that we can actually optimize our price, uh, our revenue by pricing just right for the right people. So these are the new trends of new business. These are the trends of the new business model that is based on data. Yeah? And if we look at the new value pools, before this, 100% value pools are based on sales of product. Now, we have even, we, we have value pools based on data. As I've mentioned, direct monetization from data and also indirect monetization from the insights that we obtain by, the, by, by analyzing the data we collected. So what is big data? In simple words, big data are large set of data that is impossible to manage and process using traditional business intelligence tools. It started in 2005, and now we have the entire data tooling ecosystem that has since been created to mitigate data speed and volume problems. So people always talk about the different Vs of big data. I'm, only go I'm going to cover only four of the Vs. Volume, variety, velocity, and veracity. Just to, give, so that, just to make sure that we are all on equal ground in understanding what big data is. 
in terms of volume, we are now having a lot of data. Everything, everywhere, things or everything are interconnected. Just imagine everything that we see in front of us now have senses that can sense, that can record audio, video, images, temperature, humidity, and so on. Yeah? Imagine if we have the sensor inside our body, inside our heart, inside our, blood, our arteries, for example, which can sense or which can detect our blood pressure, our heart rate in real time. And imagine if we have many of these senses in our body. And imagine if many people have these senses. Can you imagine how much data is streaming? Yeah? And how much data and insights that we can get from all these data collected from the different sources. In comparative volume, yeah, we used to think that the data of an entire enterprise is very big, yeah, which we store in data warehouse. Yeah? But that is equivalent to only one day data in any stock market. And it's equivalent, the whole entire data of an enterprise is equivalent to only one minute data, one minute of data that can be emitted by a commercial flight. Now, countries around the world, there is an inter-country project on square kilometer array radio telescope yeah, to be built in Australia and South Africa. And it is said to be able to detect events billion of light years away from the Earth. We can know what happened in the beginning of time and possibly we can know what will happen to the universe in the future. And what data, set, what data does it generate? More data per day than the entire internet. So these are the volumes of data that we are, that, that we are facing today. And everything we do is leaving a digital trace. When you use your internet, when you use your social media or mobile phone, everything can be traced and leave a data that can be mined. Yeah? Comparatively, if we look at the world population, a big percentage of our world population is using mobile phones, social media, and internet. And the percentage keep on increasing. So all these are living data yeah, that I said yeah, can be mined, can be monetized yeah, either directly or indirectly. Even with COVID-19, there is an increase in online and digital activities. More people are using um, video games, mobile apps, up, um, uploading and downloading video and so on. So the, the data volumes are now exploding. We can see the graph. It's estimated that we will produce 175 zettabytes of data by the year 2025. And 90% of the data is generated in the last two years. And only 5% is structured. So the volume keep on increasing, 40% increase per year. Yeah? And more than 25% of this data will be created in real time. And 90% of the data is created by what I said, Internet of Things. Yeah? So we have different kinds of data, yeah? from ERP data, from what we purchase, yeah? to uh, how we use the web or the internet, yeah? that up to the census, right? which gets streaming data. So these are the volume of data that we are talking about today. The second V is velocity. When we talk about, about velocity, it's basically referring to the speed of data. Yeah? We are no more dealing with data at rest as we used to deal in the past. Yeah? But we are, dealing, we are dealing data that is in motion now. Speed refer to the speed of how data is generated. Look at that uh, graph, that, that, that diagram there. You know, and you can see for yourself yeah, how many Facebook like per minute, how many YouTube upload per minute, how many tweets per minute, and so on. Yeah? And we are also looking at the speed data is transferred and analyzed. We are going to have more and more of self-driving car. The self-driving car has sensors around the car, yeah, and it can sense and get streaming data from its environment, from traffic light, from the roads, from the car around it. And it has to be streamed very fast 
and analyze very fast in memory so that it can react uh, very fast to avoid accidents and so on. So you can imagine the speed of data that we are generating and the speed of how we have to process our data. It's no more transferring data from the secondary storage into the memory, but data is captured and straight away analyzed in memory. Okay, the third V is variety. Yeah. We are not talking only about structured data, but unstructured data, such as the one we get from social media, from uh, customer services, sensor data from RFID, QR code, GPS, temperature data, and also new types of data, for example, video, voice, and so on, digital images. Yeah? Okay. to big data with all this high volume, high velocity More and more companies yeah, are investing in big data projects, so we cannot run away from big data. And if we look at technologies likely to be adopted by 2035, big data is one of them. Yeah? And this is the data market size revenue forecast worldwide. Yeah? The big data market size revenue is forecasted to be more than 100 billion US dollars by the year 2027. So even with COVID-19, yeah, there is increase in global revenue for BDA, global BI market, and so on. So how well can we analyze and use this ever increasing volume of data? Are we capable to are we capable to analyze this data? Now look, let's look at the trend now. Digital capacity trend. Processor, our CPU are much, much faster and with massive parallel processing capabilities and so on. Before it can be processed. Now, it's no more like that. Data are digitally generated, passively produced. We use our mobile phone, we don't know that the data is being collected and also we can track the geography of the data where you produce the data when you produce the data that is geographically and temporarily temporarily trackable continuously analyze without having to put it in secondary storage and transfer into memory yeah? it's in memory processing now yeah and if you look at data type strength yeah we have data exhaust where data are passively collected from transaction that you make with your mobile phone, with the web searches and so on. We have physical sensors that, uh, that collect our data, for example, from satellites and infrared imagery of changing landscape, for example. Yeah? Uh, online information, yeah, such as news media, social media. And when you fill in a survey, for example, we can get data from citizen reporting and crowdsource data. Yeah? So in terms
different from the data. We are going to see some examples later in this course, yeah. in this talk. Yeah? And in terms of reality mining, now yeah. we can have continuous data analysis over streaming data. We can scrap, you know, we have many scrapping tools to scrap online data yeah, and then process them straight away. Yeah? I'm going to show uh, also yeah, this example. Yeah? Online digestion, digestion of semi-structured and structured data, for example, news item, product reviews, and so on, so that we can know what is the perception of people on things, what they like, and so on. Yeah? And real-time correlation of streaming data with historical data, so that yeah, we can give new, we can give historical context to new data. So these are the trends that we are facing now. Yeah? The new data ecosystem is where data collected from individuals, from public and development sector and private sector yeah, are combined and analyzed yeah, to, to support a lot of decisions. For example, faster outbreak uh, response, faster outbreak tracking and response, yeah, understanding of a, uh, of a, a crisis behavior and so on. Yeah? So this is the current trend and beyond. What, we get, what can we expect next apart from what I've said? Yeah? Now we are in the era of age computing. Yeah, computation are done nearer to the physical data sources at the network edge rather than having to transport the data over the network to the server to be processed. Now, yeah, we have an environment yeah, which combines development environment and operational environment. Yeah, we have a whole set of paradigm processes and tools to do that so that whatever we software engineer develop can straight away be put into operation and faster uh, it can deliver faster value to the users of what we develop. We are also talking about data as a service. Now, we can subscribe to different types of data from Facebook, for example, and from Asia. Now, they are offering also data as a service and so on. Yeah? I've known many companies who provide data as a service. They sell data. Yeah? And now, before this, you know, for those in computer science, when we develop data model, normally we have to use a lot of data. But the trend is we are going from big to small and wide data, meaning that our data model will be able to learn from less data, but with very unstructured and structured data sources. Yeah? And then we have smarter, more responsible and scalable AI that are able to learn in shorter time. Yeah? And then you know, now it's no more programming like we used to program before. It's all component-based, composable data, composable analytics, which we can just put together yeah? to give or produce what we want to do. Yeah. And in terms of augmented consumer, now we can get insights of one particular user, one particular customer dynamically, yeah, by customizing, by dynamic you know, uh, insights analytics of the user needs. Yeah. And then in, in case we have a, you know, a very big decision to make, yeah, we now have a, you know, a trend of grouping sequences of decision into business process and network so that yeah, we can make better decision making. And there are a lot more. Yeah? For example, dark data. Yeah? Before these companies used to collect data that they not use, that they, they, that they do not use. Now the trend is to look at this data and see how it can be of value to the companies. Yeah? We are going more into natural language processing, predictive analytics, data lakes, yeah? hybrid cloud, yeah? where we not only use on-premise infrastructure, but a hybrid between on-prem infrastructure, public cloud, and private cloud. Yeah? And data analytics is becoming core functions to many organizations. Yeah? We graph everything, we do quantum computing, and we have data fabric of data across our, uh, uh, infrastructure, uh, across our um, enterprise architecture. Yeah? Malaysia also is going into public sector big data. Mission also is going big into big data. Mampu have announced the data raya sector awam or public sector big data. Yeah, we have big data digital government open innovation network. Yeah, um, Mampu have done a number of proof of concept, for example, crime analytics, price analytics, and so on. Yeah, and um, we have set up the national big data analytics center. We have um, proof of concept or data analytics for predicting climate change over a hundred years, over a hundred years. We can predict, you know, we can see what are the effects of weather and recession on our construction progress. Um, recently, Microsoft has uh, announced that they are going to spend $1 billion to set up data centers in Malaysia. 
and we also have the centralized aid recipient database by Mawit, yeah, by Majlis Agama Islam Raya Kusutua. In Johor, yeah, they have announced Kulai to be the data hub and they have a number of projects such as Iskandar Malaysia Urban Observatory where they can produce this data to support the vision for public benefits. Yeah? And if you look at the news coverage of Malaysia in 2020, there is high coverage on big data to show the importance of big data to Malaysian public. Yeah? And uh, a survey of Malaysia AI blueprint estimated yeah, that our big data analytics maturity is at a level systematic. Yeah, where more organizations are investing in machine learning and um, there are recurring budget for business unit for big data analytics. Okay, now, yeah, with all these promises of data and trends, what can we expect in the future? Yeah? Look at what China did with their uh, COVID-19 data. They collected, for example, from travel history, location, self assess health status, yeah? and close contact, okay, and they process it, and then they can say, you know, for each particular citizen, you have to have 14-day quarantine or 7-day quarantine, or you are free to move. Yeah? Okay, in understanding and targeting customers, we are now looking at data beyond traditional data set, beyond of what you have collected about your customer. You can use social media data, browser, text analytics, or sensor data to get a more complete picture of your customer. So then, yeah, you can, for example, have a better insurance structure yeah, for your customer. You can predict customer chain. You can predict what product will sell because you know your customer. And you can understand your competition. And you can also boost customer acquisition and retention and target advertising and marketing campaigns. Yeah. Now we are looking at a customer segment of one. Yeah. We can analyze the mortgage, the purchases, what the customer post on Facebook yeah, in terms of the photos, what link, yeah, what link they put on Twitter, yeah, their current mortgage and so on. Yeah. I know of a company, yeah, because they say you know, normally sometimes you just look at the data yeah, of your clients inside your database. But there are companies who actually you know, give certain mobile apps for free so that it gives to thousands of people. And these people use the mobile apps you know, with the agreement that their data will be collected. So this company you know, analyzes the data and make persona of people. For example, a woman 50 years of age is likely to buy what? Is likely to do what? So they can sell to companies, for example, for insurance company or advertising company, so that if the company or the banks have certain similarity between each client and this persona, then they can know you know, what uh, what product they want to offer to the customer. I know that they even sell to perfume manufacturer so that the perfume manufacturer know what type of perfume is suitable for what type of person because of the activity of the person from the data. Okay? So now, you know, we are, we are making our customer segment smaller until we can make a very customized product and offering to one customer instead of, you know, like, okay, one product suits all. No, that, those kind of campaign are no more yeah, with big data analytics. In terms of sales intelligence, yeah, we can know which unit is sold, where, you know, what time is good for selling what kind of, um, what kind of product and so on. Yeah? And we can also optimize our business process, for example, from social media, web search trend and weather forecast, we can know what stock yeah, to be in, what time. Yeah? And we can even customize our supply chain or delivery route based on GPS, based on traffic data, based on RFID sensors and so on. Yeah? So let's look um, Let's look at one video yeah, um, about retail analytics.
that is how Zara optimize their stock yeah, and know what to sell when. We can also look at price optimization data can be used to know what price you should, you know, what hotel price should be raised up when based on who have visited you, based on the trends, based on, you know, uh, the sentiment in the market and so on. Yeah. We can also understand and predict disease pattern better. Yeah? Now there are smart washes and wearable devices which can help us better understand the link between lifestyle and diseases. And there are many research such as the one I showed you know, uh, on the screen, yeah? whereby we can predict and monitor epidemics and disease outbreak by simply listening to what people say on Twitter, what they search on Facebook. Yeah? So the data show that it's very much correlated yeah, in terms of flu, in terms of dengue outbreak, and so on. Yeah? Okay, this is another example. This is another example that I'm going to give in terms of big data in analytics. So if you want to think about the future of medicine and what that entails, think today about the largest car company in the world. Uber doesn't own a single car. Think of the largest hotel chain in the world today. Airbnb doesn't own a single hotel. The biggest medical systems in the future are going to own no hospitals. It's going to be devices that are monitoring the lives of millions of patients simultaneously that's looking to see do you have the beginning signs of a cancer emerging to not treat the cancer but to prevent the cancer from ever occurring. Like that, that day is definitely coming. My name is Dr. Eric Schott. I'm director of the Icon Institute at the Mount Sinai Health System in New York. Please call me Eric, I'm not a real doctor. Big data's impact on the practice of medicine is fundamentally gonna transform the physician's ability to personalize care directly for you. And the way we're gonna get that is you have a handheld device that has amazing capability and Bluetooth enabled uh, inhalers for asthma patients, scales, blood pressure monitors, EKG devices. The sequencing of the human genome, that first genome cost us $3 billion to sequence. Today you can do it for $1,000. We're gonna have individualized models for each person that maps out their health course trajectory. It will be something that you're engaged in on a daily basis, but not necessarily actively. You're just being triggered if you need to be because the algorithm says, okay, you're at super high risk in the next year of uh, progressing into type two diabetes. So if you can catch that before the catastrophic state, then the person's not having to come into the, into the hospital. So imagine we can have all this data and avoid disease and heart attack, for example. What a wonderful world we will be in. And this is from our neighboring country. From birth, yeah, they can identify which baby are at risk for different health outcome, for example, diabetic and so on. By analyzing the DNA of the babies and the medical history of the patient, they can know, you know, and they, from that, they can learn about the current and future burden of the disease. Yeah? From the lifestyle um, data they collected, from what their citizen purchased, they can know, for example, how many dialysis centers that they have to set up now and in the future. They predict you know, those kind of things. And personalized drug treatment, as has been mentioned before, is based on your DNA, your lifestyle, and so on. So it's no more one drug for everybody. It's personalized based on your DNA, your lifestyle, and who you are. Yeah? And I've also seen people you know, from the birth when they get the DNA of the babies, they can compare the DNA with artists, for example, with lawyers, with soldiers, and they can predict what career are your baby most suitable for. And therefore, yeah, you can plan for it so that your baby yeah, can have 
the best future based on the inherent potential that the baby has. In terms of sport, yeah, now they are, people are using video analytics yeah, to track video performance of players during matches. And they can say, oh, okay, this is what you do wrong. You know, this is the move of your opponents and this is what you should do next time. Yeah? And now there are sensor technology built into sports equipment, for example, golf club and so on, that can analyze yeah, where you go around, where you have to improve and so on. Athletes are being tracked with smart technology to track their nutrition, their sleep, what they converse on social media to monitor whether they are emotionally well or not. McLaren yeah, put real-time car sensors during uh, data during um, car races to identify issues yeah, with its racing car using predictive analytics and take corrective action proactively in real time before it even happened. In optimizing city, yeah, cities are now using real-time traffic information, weather data, social media data to actually route uh, traffic so that uh, they can minimize jam. Yeah? There is also a case study yeah, where they look at what their citizen purchase yeah, to detect whether there will be a um, terrorist attack yeah, based on, you know, for example, we can see a lot of purchases are being made yeah, uh, for material that can make bombs, for example. They can look at what their citizen search on Google to understand whether there will be an onset of unemployment for example, yeah, and things like that. We can have, you know, we can have a lot of video cameras, for example, that can predict whether a certain behavior is abnormal, yeah, and maybe relate to certain crime. Yeah. So these are cities of the future, which optimizes on data. So now with all these promises, what are the challenges now that we have? Okay, I'm going to in this part of the talk, I'm going to give, yeah. I'm going to dwell into more technical um, discussion on the research that we do at UTM. In UTM, yeah, we do a big that you know we 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 do research in the whole chain of big data, from business process analysis to data extraction to how we organize data in data lakes and data warehouse to the analytics design and visualization through dashboards. Yeah. So these are examples of projects that we do at UTM. Mainly, this is the project that I hate or I supervise. Yeah? Uh, we have bioinformatics and chemformatics, text analytics, social media analytics, and we have produced you know, a number of products. Yeah? And we also have collaborated with many external collaborators and clients. Yeah? For example, before this, yeah, we have made a, a number of proof of concept for analyzing um, foreign worker impact in Pengarang. At that time, Pengarang is under Majlis Daerah Kota Tinggi and we do it uh, with Majlis Daerah Kota Tinggi. So, for example, this is crime analytics. We also do uh, disease analytics, yeah, complaint analytics, employee overview analytics, yeah, uh, employee resident analytics, average salary analytics, yeah, facilities analytics, and traffic incident analytics for Pengarang. Uh, we were also appointed one time ago, uh, uh, quite some years ago, uh, as advisor to the data advisor, uh, as data advisor for Jacob, and we made a number of uh, dashboard uh, for the management and the board to use, such as uh, project monitoring dashboard, financial analysis dash dashboard, human resource dashboard, um, uh, the hospital operation dashboard. And we also track uh, the performance of the hospital yeah, using uh, you know, the, the satisfaction uh, survey data from uh, their patients, uh, comparing the revenue data, hospital management and health tourism data and hospital mortality data with the data that we crawl from the internet. Yeah? And uh, for Mohi, I've also been involved in a project headed by Professor Rose, uh, where I was put in charge of the, developing the data warehouse for Mohi where yeah, we collected data from uh, several sources, yeah, several disparate uh, sources, uh, or several systems, uh, different systems in Mohi into uh, a data warehouse for Mohi. And uh, that data is used for a number of analytics at Mohi. Yeah? Um, I'm also involved in um, the uh, development of integrated mobile ordering system for MMHC, where we get data from um, the engineers, when they, um, when they um, 
uh, when they maintain ships, for example, and color it and um, combine it with data from uh, their ERP and also from their suppliers, yeah, so that they can um, intelligently select online bidding, yeah, uh, look at uh, the technical evaluation and purchase of approval, and they can know quick status notification of uh, the different stakeholders in the whole process. Okay, I am uh, involved a lot in computer-aided drug design. Yeah? As we can see, it is a very, very lucrative industry with more than 1.3 trillion yeah, uh, in terms of revenue. And when we look at the process of drug design, it's a long process from 10 to 15 years. Yeah? So we are using chem informatics and yeah, analyzing chemical data so that we can cut short the cost and the time to develop drugs. Yeah? So um, this is considered big data because we can see there are exponential growth of chemical data over the years. And for this talk, I'm only going to talk about similarity searching in computer-aided drug design, where we don't know the, the protein structure, but we know a number of ligands that can react against a particular disease. Yeah? So this is used to develop one of uh, our products, which have won the um, bronze medal at the bioinnovation competition. Yeah, it's UTM uh, chemical workbench. Yeah? This is where we do a number of searches and we have shown that it works because we know that when uh, we have studied and we have analyzed when molecules have high structural similarity, they also have high likelihood of having a similar bioactivity. Yeah? So, for example, we have a potent, promising drug, drug, drug molecule. For example, we extract something from our natural plant in Malaysia, but we don't know what is it good for. So we can search chemical compound with similar structure. We have collected and subscribed databases of known um, drug molecules. And for example, if we have that molecule that we don't know what is the likely bioactivity of that compound, we search, and then we can look at the top structures. What are the activities or the most common activities among the top structures that are similar to that structure that we want to know um, the bioactivity? And for example, yeah, for example, we have a database of unknown activity. For example, we have collected thousands of data from our natural product, from our plant, uh, from our fauna and flora. And we want to know, eh, for example, we want to investigate certain disease. So what we do is um, we find that we get the bioactivity of interest and we choose our compound database and we do the searching yeah, so that we can find out, you know, uh, which plant or which compound is good for what type of disease. And for that purpose, we have developed a lot of similarity searching. We also do a lot of work on text analytics. As we can see, there are large volume of data in text form from day-to-day -day use of the internet and so on. Yeah? So I've listed eight challenges, which I'm going to go into one by one. Yeah? And, and I'm going to share what research we do in UTM to uh, tackle all these um, challenges. First, before we can uh, use our data, we have to know how to represent the data inside our computer. For example, molecules. Yeah? Traditionally, molecules are stored as graph. The atom yeah, is the node of the graph and the bonds are the edges. Yeah? And from papers and research before us, yeah, they have shown that the 2D bit descriptors yeah, here, yeah, where they have fragment dictionary, yeah, is used to is used to produce fingerprints of the molecule. For example, if the molecule contains that fragment, it, they are going to on the bit, and if it doesn't contain that fragment, they are going to off the bit. Yeah? But, and they have shown that it's the best, and industry use it. But we challenge that. Yeah? We try with different molecular, uh, molecular descriptors. For example, this is shape descriptor, where we just transverse the 2D diagram, yeah? and as we go along, we record the atom, the bond, the angles, and so on. And we put, you know, for matching, we use longest common subsequence. And we see from our results, it's better than the Tadimoto, uh, sorry, the bit string uh, similarity measures that have been said to be the best. Yeah? We also try different things. For example, from the string, yeah, we create fragments and we count the frequency and we use this similarity calculation. And again, yeah, we found out that it's better than the bit string similarity measures. We also use different kinds of things. For example, multi-label neighborhood of atom. For example, we record the neighborhood of the atom and the the neighborhood of that neighbors and so on until we get a final representation and we also use shape-based molecular descriptors for example we just transverse and we record it like this yeah and it gives us quite good results yeah but now yeah, deep learning how can we present the molecules using deep learning 
So what is deep learning? Deep learning is basically multiple deep layers of neural network model. Yeah. So it actually uh, it is actually a hierarchical data representation where the higher level learns from the lower level. Yeah. And as you can see from the graph, yeah. Older learning algorithm, this technique in terms of performance where the data grows. But deep learning flourish when we have a lot of data. It gets better and better when we have a lot of data. So one of the basic deep learning algorithm is convolutional neural network. For example, you have the data in terms of, for example, pixel, and you use a filter and you find a dot product. So from the big data here, from the data that you have here, yeah, you can have you no know, smaller data set. That is the convolution phase. In the pooling phase, what you do is, for example, you use max pooling. You try to find the maximum in each area of your data from the um, convolution layer. And you can do it many times. You can repeat, repeat convolution, max pooling, convolution, max pooling until you can get a much smaller representation yeah, of your molecules in this case. And then you can fit it into a fully connected fit forward. Yeah? So we have tried it. How do we represent molecules using deep learning? So this is what we do. For example, we want to present, represent one compound. We search it against a compound, a database of known molecules. And from the similarity value for each of the molecule, uh, uh, the comparison of that molecule with, with each of the molecule in the database, we record the value. This is represented using different hue, as you can see. Yeah? So we can see for different activity classes, it has a different visual of images. Yeah? And when we do, when we search using our CNN, it gives much better than the previous um, similarity, uh, the previous sim uh, representation. We also use different kind of CNN. For example, for the atom, we represent using different color for different atom for the bond between different size. When and we also get good results. Yeah? And we also try different types of deep learning representation. For example, this is using uh, auto encoder. Yeah where eh, we fit the, the fingerprint of the molecules, we use autoencoder uh, to treat it until we can get the reconstructed data, and we put that reconstructed data into tiny motor images, and we get good results as can be seen. Yeah? Okay. We also use a deep belief network, where we put stacks of restricted Boltzmann machine, yeah? and uh, it learns uh, greedy wisely uh, among the layers until we can get you know, the reconstructed feature. We compare the reconstructed feature with the original fingerprint to get the reconstruction feature error. And then we transpose the metric, for example, for each feature now, what are the reconstruction error for all the molecules? We do a PCA, we find which uh, features have the least distance in terms of the, uh, meaning that which features have the least reconstruction, reconstruction error, and we use it for uh, our top 10 motor virtual screening, and it gives us very good results. Yeah? I'm not going to explain very detail because I put uh, our papers there eh, eh, uh, underneath my presentation if you want to know more about it. We also use different combination of that deep belief network. Eh? For example, uh, two com the combination of two fingerprints, three fingerprints, up to five fingerprints. Eh? Uh, and then we find out which is the best combination and it gives us even better results. Yeah? So that is in terms of molecule. We also do a lot of research in terms of cross-language intelligent idea plagiarism. For plagiarism, for example, yeah, many of the commercial intelligent plag uh, many of the commercial plagiarism detection software only detect cut and paste plagiarism. But from our study, we know that there are many types of plagiarism, idea plagiarism. Yeah, you can switch, you know, the voice of the sentence. Yeah? I drive car, car driven by me. Commercial software cannot detect it. Yeah? Or you change, you know, the word I drive car, I drive motor car, cannot detect, eh? the commercial software cannot detect. Yeah? Um, saya bawa kereta, in Malay, yeah? cannot detect. Yeah? So if we present our data, our text using the normal sentence representation, we cannot catch, yeah? we using the normal n-grams, for example, we cannot catch this kind of idea plagiarism. So what we do yeah, is we extract predicates from centers such as this. Yeah? We extract the predicates and then uh, we compare all the predicates between the two sentences. How do we calculate the similarity using the uh, information content of the common uh, the common ancestors yeah? in WordNet. Yeah? And it's you know uh, translated into our product which won uh, the Pachipta gold medal. And we can see yeah, compared to the common way of comparing, ours is better 
yeah, in term of precision recall and F measure. Yeah, I will a semantic comparison, we call it. Yeah, because, you know, whatever words you use, they can detect yeah, uh, the similarity. And also, we put it into translator. Yeah, and we can see, we can detect, you know, for example, from Malay document, you translate and produce an English document. Is it the same document? Idea is the same. Yeah, so we can detect better than uh, the common way of doing it. Yeah? And from that, actually, we have tried many things. Yeah? We can see whether people copy from the figures. For example, this is figure for plagiarism. Yeah? We look at the text explaining the figure. We represent the figures. Yeah? We look at, you know, for example, concept graph. Yeah? How do we produce concepts, a uh, graph of concepts in the text? For example, we look at um, you know, structural component weighting. For example, we have a way to calculate the weights of the different uh, component in the text. For example, if you copy uh, from the, uh, the literature review section, it's not as bad as you copy in the results and discussion section. We have a way to copy that. We put it into fuzzy inference engine. We look whether you have cite, uh, we have you have properly cite the uh, reference and so on, and we get quite a number of good results there. Yeah? We also process, for example, ECG data. Yeah, how do we use is how do we process ECG signals to detect arrhythmia? Yeah, or different types of arrhythmia. Yeah, so we also try different representation of the ECG signal. For example, we try the um, fuzzy. Yeah, we try moving of fuzzy membership of local binary pattern combined with discrete wave transform combined with IOM statistics, and we got good results compared to um, some um, uh, conventional way of representing the ECG. We use also different types of extreme learning machine, different types of feature reduction, such, such as alpha shape and so on, yeah, uh, to give even better results. Okay, in our labs, yeah, we also look at how from unstructured data you can extract into structured data. Yeah, for this project, yeah, of Quran translation uh, from uh, English translation of Quran text, yeah, we collaborate with 30 ustads, yeah, from around Malaysia. So we asked the Ustad, you know, from the Quran, yeah, we took prayer only. Yeah? So what are the terms, the synonym, the concept, the hierarchy, the relation, the rules that you can find in the Quran? So we make, you know, our own hybrid approach of natural language processing and statistics and rules. Yeah? And this is what we obtain yeah? in terms of precision, recall and F measure compared to what the Ustad has done. Yeah? So we do it automatically. That product won a gold medal at the iInnova convention. Um, we also look at how you know we can detect human activity through sensors. In this case, here yeah, we develop probabilistic ontology knowledge model to detect human activity recognition. Yeah, and we got you know we, we can get you know up to quite a good level in terms of detecting what activity the human is doing. Yeah, uh, based on our model. The second part is comparing data. Yeah, the second challenge, how do we compare data? We talk about similarity between human, similarity between things before we can make decision. Yeah? So I again, I use my molecular similarity uh, problem, yeah? for example. Tanemoto coefficient has been shown yeah, to be the best coefficient to search molecular database. Yeah? But we run experiment and we know that it's not the best. Yeah? And we even find out that for certain types of molecules, for example, certain size of molecules, Different coefficients are good. Yeah? For example, smaller one, you use Forbes. Big one, you use Russell Rao, for example. Yeah? And we try to combine the coefficient. And we found out that the combined combination, the fused co uh, coefficient, give better results than the best singular coefficient. Yeah? For, and then we try to see whether you know what to combine to get what type of molecules. We even modify the coefficient. For example, this is a uh, modified sim simple similarity measure. Yeah, this uh, which have good results compared to the industry standard Tanimoto. We use adapted spreading measure from tax processing. Yeah? Okay, also to good results and also we use maximum marginal relevance. And this is the result. And so modify the yeah? similarity measure, fuse it, look at what is good for what. Yeah? The third challenge is searching data. How do we search data? Now, in molecular similarity, yeah, it has been found yeah, uh, before our work, People represent uh, or people do similarity searching, searching through vector space model, meaning that you know, they find vectors representing the molecules and then they compare it using coefficient. So we try to challenge that. Can we do something different? So we use Bayesian inference network, yeah, where we have the compound network representing the compounds in the database and we have the query network representing the query, yeah, where 
Yeah, we find probability that a target molecule A is observed given compound C has been observed. And we use Bayes inference rule for that. Yeah? And we found out it's better than the industry than standard study model that people have said to be the best. Yeah? Okay, and we modify it and we look at you know the results in terms of atom, uh, unique atomic structure, yeah? unique atomic framework, and we find it to be also good in terms of that. Yeah? So we use multiple structure yeah, uh, for the reference, yeah, and we enhance the basin inference network. We use uh, single, uh, this is what we, we got. Yeah? Okay, and then we, we use, we use you know, we extend the, the basic inference network to include multiple molecular descriptors, yeah? And uh, this is also, you know, obviously, you know, we could get better and better results every time, yeah? So we use also different fragment weightings, yeah? And that is what we got, yeah, compared to our initial binary inference network, yeah? And we also use basin belief network where the calculation is a bit different and we found out that it's good when the data set is highly diverse. Yeah, so that we can get you know better uh, better chances of finding lead from upper uh, lead in terms of lead optimization. Yeah, we also use relevant feedback. For example, we search the, uh, the the database once and we got the top molecules. We look at the weights of the you know, the fragments in the top molecules. Which fragment always occur? So we adjust the weight and then we search again using the weighting of the new weighting of the fragment. And we also use group fusion. For example, we got the top structures. We search again, yeah, uh, using the top structures, and we fuse the results. And this is what we got, yeah, very good results compared to just using the binary, uh, the original binary inference network. Yeah, we also calculate the importance of the features, yeah, using this formula, and we only use the important fragment, yeah, and this is the results. And then we also throw away the highly uh, the, uh, the the most frequent fragments that occur in the molecular database and the least frequent and this is what we got and when we combine yeah, we get even better results yeah so this is how research progresses here yeah, in our lab yeah and we also use quantum mechanics for molecular retrieval yeah where we represent yeah the uh, we represent the molecules in one Hilbert space yeah uh, uh, met, uh, we do this mathematical representation of molecules in Hilbert space and the second part we use uh, complex number yeah so for complex number we have real part yeah, for the global weight of fragment and imaginary part for the local weight of fragment this is the formula that we use and we find it to be better than the industry standard standard Tanimoto. we use also an uh, enhanced CMS uh, um, recurrent neural network and LS, uh, LSTM model for example this is where we use the LSTM model yeah uh, to search um, uh, our fingerprint, yeah. So well, the fingerprint molecule in the query and in the database we represent using LSTM. Yeah. Then we find the difference. Yeah. We find two. Uh, we use two um, similarity measures here. Yeah. To find the difference between the query molecule and the target molecule, and we put it under uh, some sort of uh, convolutional neural network architecture. Yeah? And this is where we change. Yeah. The, because LSTM, you know, actually is R and N, yeah, but it has a number of gates, yeah, like forget gate that avoid the problem of vanishing gradient and exploding gradient. In GRU, we have a number of different gates there, yeah, reset gate and update gate. The yeah, same architecture we use CNN also, as I explained before here, yeah, but it's Siamese now, and yeah, we use 2D CNN. Yeah, and the results, yeah, the CNN 1D gives us best results. Yeah. So this is how we enhance yeah, the searching of molecules. Now, in terms of how we combine different data, yeah. So um, when we do our drug design research, yeah, computer aided drug design, we not only use the molecular database, but we look at the literature. In this case, pharmacovigilance literature, yeah, to detect whether the molecule has adverse drug effect, whether a certain drug has adverse drug effect. So this is what we do. Yeah. For example, we look at the literature, yeah, and we look at the sentences people have presented or written in the literature. So there are positive sentences containing adverse drug effect and negative sentence, although looks like containing drug effects but doesn't contain drug effect. So we look at the pattern, yeah. We look at the pattern, yeah? and then uh, we also uh, enhance yeah, the pattern by manually creating the learned linguistic pattern, yeah. And this is the result that we get. The poll one is ours, yeah. We compare it with state of the art method, yeah. Okay. Um. We also represent the pattern using. Uh, dependency tree yeah, where yeah, 
uh, we build the relation type keywords and then we build mining rules and convert them to convert them to mining algorithm. And this is the result that we get. Yeah. We also do, you know, um, put it in case-based reasoning model and we get even better results. Yeah. Okay, in terms of you know, still yeah, in the topic of how we combine data, yeah, um, for predicting stock market, yeah, the conventional way is using um, the closing price in time series. We see whether we can use news yeah, to even predict the stock market, the, the closing price of stock market better. So uh, we convert the new uh, the new start into time series of vectors. Yeah, I'm going to explain later. This is word to vec. Yeah. Okay, later I'm going to explain in more detail when we talk about sentiment analysis. And we found out and we use different uh, discrete uh, uh, recurrent neural network, discrete long short term memory. And when we use news, you can see that you know uh, when we use news, we get lower error compared to what predicted with the actual closing price of the stocks. Eh? We also look at different things that can affect stock market. For example, this is weather phenomena. And this time, eh, we use crude palm oil price, eh, prediction of, of we forecast crude palm oil. Yeah? We look at you know, different things, yeah? for example, the historical data, yeah? um, other commodity, da commodity data, weather data, and also news. Yeah? So this is what we do, for example, for other edible oil prices, we look at uh, corn oil, yeah? uh, olive oil, coconut oil, soybean oil, or whether we look at temperature, humidity, all time series, yeah? and we look at the news headline sentiment, whether it's positive and negative. Yeah? And then when we combine and we predict, yeah, it shows that you know LSTM is the best. Yeah? We use LSTM, long short term memory, yeah? also a deep learning algorithm. And when we combine different uh, variables, yeah? like commodity, weather, and news element, it gives us lower error yeah? in terms of the prediction of the um, uh, stock prices. Yeah? Uh, we also do some uh, research yeah, uh, for tenant analytics, yeah, um, starting from a grant we, uh, from ETH, yeah, and we use not only data yeah, inside the organization, this is to predict leadership, yeah, whether a leader is suitable or not suitable for a certain position. Yeah, uh, there are five levels, exceedingly suitable, suitable, and so on. Yeah. But we also look at social media, what you talk about yourself, what people talk about you, you know, 360 evaluation and yeah, other, you know, things in the media about you and we map it to um, this is the competency framework that we uh, have developed. So we combine the data to get even better prediction. And as, as I told you, we combine data from different, this is common, eh? combining different data from different data uh, databases into data warehouse. So now, eh? the fifth challenge is summarizing data. Yeah? So now let's look at again our compound database. Eh? Now we have more compounds available that, uh, than what can be screened cost effectively? So, for example, yeah, um, apart from data that we can purchase, yeah, um, compound data that we can purchase from supplier, now people do combinatorial chemistry. Yeah? They combine the different fragments yeah, into uh, different molecules in the computer. For example, if I'm combining these two fragments, yeah, and I have 1,000 of this R1, yeah, right, uh, and then R1 group, and 1,000 of this R2 group, I can simply have 1 million fragments. Yeah? So imagine if we have many R groups with many possible um, um, possible um, compounds or uh, structure that fit the bill of that um, R group. Yeah? So um, one of the ways people do it is to cluster the, the chemical compound database and select one for each cluster. Yeah? The worst clustering algorithm is um, the best clustering algorithm that has been found and is used in the um, industry. Yeah? So we challenge that. We use fuzzy hierarchical clustering. Yeah? Uh, we use our combination of words and fuzzy. We use FCMGK. We use neural network. Yeah? And we use concessions clustering. Yeah? We combine different representation of the chemical data set, different clustering distance measure, different individual clustering technique, different parameterization uh, for the k-means, if we use k-mean, and different concessions function. And we found that if we combine, yeah, the enhanced cumulative voting based consensual algorithm gives us much better results yeah, um, uh, compared to just using the walks. What is here? Yeah, this is our consensus clustering. Yeah, and we try with many, many different types of measures and so on. And still, yeah, the results is consistent. Yeah? We also reduce them. Yeah, for example, for chemical database, is a huge dimension. Yeah? If you're talking about fragment, it can be thousands of fragments that represent the molecules. Eh? So this is what we do. For example, we use PCA. Yeah? So for each one, we get only three principal components. 
and we use DE, differential emotion optimization, to optimize and get only three dimension as opposed to the thousand of dimension eh, originally. And we found out that our method can actually separate the molecules better. Eh? This um, invention won us the silver uh, medal in, in a text. Yeah? Okay, now we have a lot of data in form of text. Yeah? How do we summarize the data? So this is the simplest one that we have um, proposed in our lab. Yeah? So from the data, from the text, we extract features. These are examples of features that have been extracted. Yeah? For example, uh, whether the sentence contain title, whether it has proper noun and so on. Yeah? Then, yeah, uh, which feature is important? We use genetic algorithm to learn which feature is important, and then uh, we fit into a fuzzy logic system of you know, uh, fuzzy logic structure. We make we fuzzify it, and then we also use semantic um, semantic representation of one to, uh, sorry of text, which I'm going to explain later. We combine it, then we extract the top scoring sentence, and we um, we look at the order in the original document, and we make our summary here. Yeah? So we find out that our methods give better results than many of the state of the arts methods, yeah? or just by using you know, GA or fuzzy only here. Yeah? And we also look at, we present also uh, the text using subgraph, for example, like this, by looking at the similarity between the sentences and we, you know, we come, you know, uh, we link certain sentences you know, uh, based on uh, certain graph shape, yeah? and then we get good results. Yeah? We also use probabilistic semantic analysis, yeah, representation to uh, create extractive summary, yeah. So that is if we only have one document. So now, yeah, on the internet we have multiple documents. How do you know? Do we expect people to read all the documents? Yeah, this is what we do. We summarize the multiple document into extractive summary. We create one summary, yeah? like you are creating one abstract for your uh, one abstract, yeah, using all the documents. So how do we do it? Yeah. So first, yeah, we extract the predicate argument structure using semantic role labeling. Yeah? So whatever, for example, we have this sentence, we extract the semantic role, yeah, then we use this um, semantic similarity measure, yeah, we make uh, clusters out of it, yeah? then for each uh, predicate in, in, in the cluster, yeah, we score it based on certain feature list, yeah. And then yeah, we select the topmost. Yeah, we have also uh, heuristic rules on what to select. Yeah, and then uh, we use simple natural uh, language generator to generate language. Yeah, uh, so we get abstractive summary. Yeah, uh, there are many variations to that. For example, yeah, you can see uh, the those are you know um, the model is human model. Yeah? human summary we compare with human summary. Yeah, and we look at you know ours is AS. Abstractive summary GASRL and ASSRL, and we can see it always perform very good compared to uh, even the best system in DUC conference. Yeah? Okay, this is uh, our work on how we summarize news component yeah? news. Yeah? So, what we do is we extract the news component, yeah? then we find the cross structural using cross structural theory, we find relationship between the sentences, whether a sentence contradicts other sentences. For example, we have many news. Yeah? Uh, which sentence subsume other sentences, which sentence follow up other sentences, and so on. There are many, many uh, relations. Yeah? And then uh, we vote, yeah? we use um, a number of uh, rules to vote which sentence should we take. Yeah? And then uh, we feed it into, uh, we use fuzzy logic, yeah? and then uh, this is the result that we get. Yeah? F1, yeah? as you can see, F1 yeah? has very low uh, um, uh, uh, error. Yeah? Uh, don't look at this because this is human. Yeah? We always benchmark with human. Yeah. Now, yeah, six challenge, settlement of facts. Many of the data that we have, you know, like I said, veracity, we don't know whether it's fact or it's sentiment. Yeah? So I just, you know, we have done a lot of sentiment analysis in our labs, yeah, but I just show one. Yeah? This is what we do actually for one corporate. Yeah? I think you will know what is the, uh, what is the uh, corporation. So um, they want to see you know, when they can offer uh, IPA, initial public offering, when can they make IPA. So we see, you know, the sentiment, yeah. We crawl the internet, eh, Facebook, Twitter, IG, and, and we look at you know the social engagement, we look at the sentiment, eh, uh, and then we look also at the competitor, eh, and then we look at the news and see, you know, we, this is all crawling, yeah, uh, whether it's positive or negative, and you know, we look at you know, if they put mouse over, we can look at uh, of course this is not real data, yeah. It's just you know for academic discussion, yeah, it's not real data about the corporation or its competitors, yeah. And when they mouse over, you can see what people talk about them. Eh? So every night we crawl, yeah, 
we put in Mongo and we analyze yeah? Mongo DB. So there are many ways yeah, to do social media. So this is what a uh, real problem that we face when we are doing that. Yeah? So there are two ways yeah? when we do some analysis. We can use rule based or corpus based, yeah? but we are using deep learning. So for example, if we use rule based, yeah? We can look at the dictionary and we can find whether yeah, this is senti word net. Yeah, this is senti word net. We can find. Uh, we look at the sentences that people post. Yeah, how many positive? This is simple. There are many you know scoring calculation that you know for the sake of time I don't put. Yeah, so uh, how many positive negative words? Yeah, and then we look at whether they have not yeah, negation. So we can have a calculation to modify. Yeah. And then we can use, you know, for, for corpus base, we have, you know, like for example, a corpus you know, that is tagged whether this center is positive, this center is negative. And then we run, um, you know, classification algorithm yeah, to learn. You know, whenever a new sentence comes in, then we know whether it's positive or negative based on what we have trained, yeah? uh, the classifier we have trained. Yeah? So people, you know, I've been contacted by many people to do sentiment analysis for them, including political sentiment. And they said, um, why Prof Nami, you charge quite high? Yeah, uh, then you will see what, yeah? You can use brand mention. Very, very uh, cheap, yeah? cheaper than our solution. But even the best tool, yeah, is only 61% accurate, yeah? Most likely is, you know, for short text, it, it 59%, yeah? So we use word to vec yeah? And this is, this is challenge I will, uh, I will explain later, yeah? So word to vec is actually, you try to predict a target word based on the contact word, yeah? Context word. Yeah, so this is what we do. There are many types. Yeah? For example, again, for the sake of simplicity, for example, we are trying to predict a target word. We look at the context word. Yeah? Or from the context word, we will try to predict the surrounding word, the neighboring word. Yeah? And we do train, train it using different, different yeah? chunks of the text. Yeah? And at the end, after training, we get the least error. Then we, we can look at the hidden note. And that is actually the vector representing the word. Yeah. So this has been proven to be very good, yeah? meaning that, you know, um, I, I've deleted the slides, yeah? meaning that it can represent the words very well. Yeah? So yeah, we train it on this data set, yeah, which we collect yeah, from Twitter and Facebook of that corporation. Yeah? And then we, this is, for example, a number of positive, negative, and Malay English. Because the, the different things is that when people post, they don't jump. Yeah? Malay English, you know, many other words. Yeah? So we took yeah, Malay English. Yeah? So if you use the you know commercial one you cannot get good results yeah so this is what we get when we train using word to net uh our word to back yeah? based on that train data not very good the data is very small yeah around 1000 yeah? and we pay people to annotate the data yeah? so it's like english 60 percent malay 51 percent yeah so on average 54 percent not good where okay? people are not happy yeah so what we do yeah, yeah so what to vest in malay is very rare yeah so we extend the Malay Corpus Corporation uh, collection yeah, by different different data set, and this is what we get: yeah, better Malay from fifty to sixty-four. Still not good enough. People still not happy. Yeah, not your, your, but if you use brand match, it will be worse. I said that yeah, like fifty percent. Yeah, uh, for, for English, if you have Rojak language, then you know it, it it gives you worse results. So we combine everything. Yeah, and this is what we have: yeah, eighty-three percent accuracy. Good enough. Good enough. Better than you know what you can find commercially. Yeah. Okay. So in terms of data quality, yeah. So this is one research that we have on how to automatically generate frequently asked questions from forums. Yeah. So when we look at the forum, yeah, to create FAQ, oh, there are many errors. Yeah. There are orthographic error. Yeah. People typographical error, phonetic error. Yeah. Contextual error, acronym that they use. Yeah. Oh, so if we use this, we are not going to get good results. So what we do is we correct the error first. To ensure that the data we use are of high quality. For example, we use TechSoup library, we use you know different libraries, yeah. We use Jazzy Spell Checker and so on, yeah, to correct all the uh, the the um, the unnormalized posts, yeah. You see, then you can get good results compared to when we do not normalize, yeah. We also have research on you know, for example, we have one initial post. What are the good reply posts? And actually, we want to summarize the reply post so that you don't have to find which reply post is suitable. Yeah? That can be best answer to your initial post. For example, I want to say, hey, uh, where do I find halal restaurant in Bangkok? Uh, and people post many, many replies. So how do you find out which one is good? You just find, you know, I say halal restaurant, okay, halal restaurant also. You know, you just um, compare um, the words that is suitable for you, uh, that, that, that matches your 
uh, query, not good if you do that. So we have to look at the quality of the reply post. For example, here, you look at time dimension, yeah? you don't want to post something that is very old, eh? or respondent activeness, something, you know, whether the respondent is active, whether, you know, you easily understand what it says, you know, politeness dimension, yeah? amount of data in that post, and so on. Eh? So we calculate it, and we found out that if you use all quality dimension, quality features, you get best result, yeah? And then we use also feature selection, yeah, even get better results. And then we try to put it in summarization, also good result. Yeah? So meaning that we have to, well, before we can do anything, we have to make sure that it's of quality. Yeah? Opinion span, yeah? sentiment analysis just now. Sometimes, you know, uh, people, you know, they want to make uh, people buy their product. So they, off, they, they pay spam uh, to write all good things about their product and bad things about the competitor product. Yeah, like we see just now, you know, sentiment analysis, competitor, and your product. Yeah? So how do we detect that it has, it's actually a span? So this is what we propose, multi-articulation graph structure. Yeah, we, we put connection between the reviewer, reviews, and product. Yeah? And we make spamicity index, yeah? and we calculate our spamicity index, and we know which review actually tak boleh pot, cannot be used. Yeah? So we throw that away. Yeah? So we find out, when we do that, I will give very good results, yeah? almost 90%. And we look at you know, whether it's tally is in agreement with a human judges and it's 89.6 percent. Yeah? In fact, in terms of this, we have tried many things here. Yeah? For example, what is you know sometimes use you know is sentiment but looks like fact. Oh, um, I eat this um, high blood pressure medicine. My blood pressure goes between 120 to 140. Looks like facts, right? But it's actually sentiment. Yeah, um, I, I didn't di disclose here because too much. Yeah, oh, and also sometimes um, sarcastic. Yeah, oh, you are very nice clothes you are wearing. Yeah, every day I see you wearing the same clothes. Uh, clothes. Yeah? Looks like positive, right? But it's actually sarcastic. So we have a way to calculate whether it's really positive or actually it's sarcasm. Uh, yeah? Okay, we also use data quality in data warehouse development and we use information content, information access, and we look at the different criteria for each one, yeah? and then we test, it gives us quite good results in terms of the data warehouse that resulted from it. Okay, finally, yeah? finally, the last challenge, yeah? how we predict, yeah? how we model and mine data for prediction. For this, I'm going to use recommendation system. Yeah? When you buy something from the Amazon, Amazon will recommend to you, right, what are other things that you can buy. And recommendation, recommendation system, and recommendation um, algorithm is, uh, is very influential yeah, to what people watch on YouTube, to what people watch on Netflix and so on. Yeah? So yeah, this is what we propose, yeah, uh, how to enhance yeah, from state of the art. Yeah? So first we look at the aspects yeah, inside the review, for example. And we use word embedding and post type embedding, yeah, and then we use um, in this case, we use conversational neural network, yeah? and then um, we use different type of MCMN, and uh, this is how we compare how we can obtain the aspects that is being referred to in the review. Yeah? Then we put it into a recommendation system model. Yeah? This is what we do, I just explained it. Eh? Uh, review with aspect term, we put in LDA, we get the aspect cluster, then we find the sentiment, yeah? we put in the rating metrics, and then we use tensor factorization machine to predict the overall rating. Yeah? Of whether one person will like one product, yeah, and we get you know quite low error. Eh? This is our we try different different types here yeah, of the MTNA, yeah, and then we can get you we can see that I was give very uh, you know little error yeah, compared to what actually the person wants, yeah, and then we use you know also you know different channel for user review and item review. For example, they have rating, so we present the user, we present the item using an FTM, and then we use you know, uh, interactive attention network and co attention network yeah, to find the user importance and item importance and combine it. Yeah? And this is what we get, yeah? even lower yeah? our our error. Yeah? Okay, sometimes things change. Yeah? So this is concept drift. So what we do is, you know, for example, you train your classifier, yeah. But you know, we see that you know sometimes we train it using old data. Yeah? When we see the new data has significant difference, yeah, based on the window, then we know you have to retrain your classifier again. So we do that. Yeah, if this changes, we retrain the classifier, put it in the assemble of classifier, and we got good results. Yeah? We also use look at you know how users change, how item change, yeah. And then we get good results also. And we use we also try to embed reviews here. Yeah? And then we look at you know how uh, users is 
presented adaptively and also in terms of the uh, dynamic item model yeah and this is the result that we get okay finally yeah for our okay um finally yeah we also uh, have done COVID-19 prediction early last year yeah, on the onset of uh, COVID-19. Yeah. Uh, we use different data crawl from the internet. We make a dashboard yeah, and we use different model. Yeah. One of the model that we use is long short term memory. Yeah. But because the data is short, yeah, we have to finish by April. The grant is only, I think, two months. Yeah. So we use data from January to April. We compare it with other conventional model. Yeah, and we find out that LSTM is not as good as fitting. Yeah, maybe because at that time only China have you know um, have what we say the downturn yeah, in terms of the new cases, the uh, new active cases of COVID nineteen. Yeah. So um, in, this is just to show that deep learning is good yeah, based on what we have shown before. But if data is small, you cannot get good results. Yeah. Okay. Finally, to the final part of my presentation. The Adiba Data Adoption and Implementation Framework. This is the first time I'm showing it in public. Yeah, we call it Adiba. Yeah, in short for Accelerating Digital Transformation. Yeah, using Big Data Adoption and Implementation Framework. Now, imagine you and uh, uh, an organization. Yeah, can we in UTM help you? Yeah, adopt and implement Big Data so that you can enjoy the values that you will provide. So you have to have the data. Yeah whether it's structured, unstructured, and so on. Yeah, You have to have the good analytics, such as the method AI, machine learning, deep learning, so that you can get valuable insights in terms of pattern, diagnostic, forecasting, and so on. So this is the framework. Yeah? You will see how we got the whole framework. So now, to get the most value, yeah, we don't want you to use just descriptive and diagnostic. Yeah? Just observe what happened and explain why it happened. We want to anticipate, yeah, predict what happened, and maybe you know, um, suggest to you action that you should take, yeah, so that yeah you can get your uh, objective better, yeah. So yeah, this is you know you have to understand yeah, to get insights from data, yeah. First, you have to be able to collect the relevant data. I'm not reading the example eh, at the bottom there. You can read it for yourself. We have to collect the data and then measure the data. Yeah, and then relate it to your business driver or your business goal, and then take action. Yeah, yeah. For example, you know, you know, like you want to know about graduate employability. Yeah. So not only you get data from inside. Yeah, you have to get data from from outside. For example, you have to measure the data, and then you can see. Yeah, relate it to your business. For example, what are your business question? Which program is not um. Uh, it is not uh, having a good graduate employment, which have, which program has good graduate employment. So what action? You have to revise the program, you train the lecturers and so on, so that you have higher graduate employability. Okay? And then when you have done that, you have to recheck. Okay, or not, you have to collect data again to see you know, whether your action as prescribed by the system is okay or not. Yeah? So when you do this, yeah, whenever you want to use big data, you have to understand. Yeah? You have to implement the whole big data value chain from acquiring the data to organizing the data to analyzing the data and delivering it for your stakeholder, for people who make decisions in terms of uh, store, uh, dashboard yeah, and how you story tell about your data. Yeah? Okay, and then you have to look also at how you want to automate yeah, from acquiring the data. Yeah? Easy if you have you know, your legacy system, but if you have to get, you know, but like I said, if you just use your own data, you will not be, we cannot say it's big data, lah, basically. Eh? You, can, you have to get data from the outside. And then you know how to organize the data in your storage, yeah? and then analyze the data using the right model, and then deliver it. Yeah? And you have to automate, you have to find what is good yeah? um, for helping you to do all, to support all this value chain. Yeah? So now, yeah? what is your organization data maturity level? Yeah, we have instrument to do it. We have done it for a number of companies. If you want, uh, later my friend will post on the Facebook, you know, if you are interested to, have, to let us uh, assess your data maturity. Yeah? Okay. For example, yeah, is your data maturity, you know, is it ad hoc, inconsistent, or is it planned and managed, or, is it, or do you have standard process across your organization? Is it quantitatively measured? Yeah? And is it optimized from time to time? Yeah? So we are going to look at different, different domains. Yeah? For example, in terms of your 
of your strategy, your data governance, data quality, data operation platform and architecture and supporting process. Yeah? And, um, and also, yeah, if I ask you today, yeah, what are the current data analytics stage in your organization? Is it aspirational, experience or transformed? Yeah? Which area you have problem? Yeah? So we also have this instrument. Again, if you want to um, if you want to collaborate with us into analyzing the stage of data analytics in your organization, you can fit in the survey form that uh, my friend is going to put yeah, uh, on uh, the chat yeah, in Facebook and YouTube. So now this is our project. This project started this year, uh, expected to end end of next year. Yeah? So this is accelerating digital transformation through big data adoption and implementation framework. Uh, this is under the Malaysian Big Data Research Consortium awarded by the Ministry of Higher Education. It consists of UTM Big Data Center, Center for Mobile Cloud Computing Research, University of Malaya, and Center for Advanced Computer Technology in UTEM. Yeah, so it has a number of things. Yeah. First project is on the framework. Yeah, what are the process framework yeah, that can be used? What are the guidelines and instruments? Yeah, that is our part, UTM part. The UM part is going to um, develop services, yeah, APIs to support this framework. The UTEM part is developing recommender, yeah, recommender system to support our framework. And we hope that in the end we can, you know, think up, you know, we can um, think up of policies, revision, guidelines, and so on to help more. You know, we hope that if we finish this, we can help more conventional Malaysian agencies to transform yeah, into digital organization by adopting yeah, and implementing big data in the organization. Yeah. So this is the Adiba main functional architecture yeah, from data sources yeah, down to beneficiaries. Yeah, it covers the data and information value chain from identifying insights and grouping the insights which is yeah, identifying the value of the insights, the effort, resources, cost and training requirement to rating and ranking of project to developing the analytics product. Yeah? We also look at the core data governance and data management capabilities, supporting IT capabilities and aid enablers such as data governance organizations, standard and process, policy and guidelines, and data security, privacy, compliance and risk management. So this is a big project. Yeah? So for you yeah, to produce values yeah, using this value chain, first you have to understand your stakeholder. Yeah? Outside yeah, your organization or inside yeah, board members, departments in your organization, yeah, uh, your parents' uh, institution, for example, supplier, customer, yeah, and other beneficiaries. So we have to see you know, what value you want to give to the different stakeholders, inside or outside, yeah, in terms of financial booster, social well-being, sustainable uh, development goals, and then what decision should be made to support this value. And then you have to see what data you need, and this is the data science workbench of Adiba. Yeah, you have to be able to search, pre-process, represent the data, reduce the dimension, model the decision, yeah, analyze it, descriptive diagnostic, and so on. Yeah, and also yeah, present your insights to the stakeholders. Yeah, so this is our Adiba process framework. Yeah, it consists of from zero to twelve main activities. Yeah. First, you have to prepare the emission of analytic culture. Then you have to, you know, understand your business, and then you have to provide mechanism to manage and govern your data. Eh? Uh, you have to plan for your projects. Eh? You have to understand your data, prepare your data. You know, um, do the procurement for your tools and infrastructure. Um, business analytics modeling, yeah, and then uh, develop the data analytics product, evaluate the product, product deploy maintain and upgrade and then how you inculturate the whole thing inside the culture or the fabric of your business. Yeah, you can have many entry points. You need not use you need not use the whole thing. Yeah. You need not use the whole thing. Yeah? Um, and there are cycles, yeah? Maybe you have to repeat certain cycles. Yeah? Okay. So um it's Azan we try to make sure I stop or not. Right? Okay, so I, I just go eh? uh just a bit. This is you know, for each one, yeah, for example, we have to prepare the mission of energy culture. We have tasks, sub tasks, detailed description, and we have instrument guidelines and templates. Yeah? Okay, let me go to this. Eh? For business understanding, for example, yeah? understanding the business. Yeah? So we have the tasks, yeah? for example, I'm just going to take one. Yeah? For example, you have to understand your goals, current environment, SWOT analysis, yeah? 
you have cut in an instrument. For example, this one, yeah? SWOT analysis. Yeah? So these are the SWOT, for example, yeah? uh, we have flow yeah, that you should follow. Yeah? Okay, for example, this is SWOT, yeah? and then you have to look for each particular component of the SWOT. What are your decision point, pinpoint, and opportunity? Yeah? Okay. Yeah? So, uh, and then for example, yeah, you have to look at your structure. Yeah. So, what are the organization structure, the roles and position in the structure, the committees involved? Yeah. And then you have to find out. Yeah. What are the activities they are making? What are you know additional insights they need to make a certain decision? Yeah. How can they predict and prepare for the future or next activity in the process? So, the entity objective can be they want to detect fraud, internal or external. They want you want to recommend something. You want to improve your process or you want to identify identify certain opportunities. Okay. And then we have sample questions to ask to identify the insights. Yeah. Uh, okay, and then for example, you know, for this role, what are the activities? What are the business opportunity? Yeah, um, let me. Okay, so for example, then we have to map to the insights. Yeah, so for this decision point, what are the insights they need? And then refer to what energy objective they now need: process improvement or recommendation, and so on. Yeah, so for each role, what are the activities inside? What what are the energy objective? Yeah, uh, so for your business objective, what are the drivers? The goals and then the objectives, things that you have to measure. What are your KI? So, for example, for example, this is your KI objective measurement. Yeah? And then what are the insights? Yeah? And then what are the analytic objectives? This is just instruments for you to use. Eh? Okay, we also have data management and governance. For example, yeah, this is the different system of data governance. For example, principal policy. Yeah. So, are the difference between principal policy and so on? Yeah. So, we have some sample uh, principles. So, what is our principle? What is your related to what policy and what guideline? Yeah. So, I'm just going to go very fast. Yeah. Um, okay. So, and then for example, you have you know data governance. How you want to govern? Uh, do data governance for your organization. For example, this is in terms of security governance framework. Eh? I'm going very fast because my time is almost up. Yeah. Um, okay, data understanding. Yeah. Uh, this is data understanding, for example. Yeah. Data preparation. Yeah. How, how you prepare your data. Eh? That, so the different things that you have to do to prepare your data. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm going, okay. For example, this is um, procurement. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to just look at data storage. Yeah? So these are the guidelines for different data storage at DMS, uh, not only SQL database, data warehouse, data lake, and then you know what are the options for data warehouse, you know, uh, what are the criteria that you have to consider when you want to use uh, choose a data warehouse platform. Okay, and then whether you want to choose cloud or on-prem, you know, what uh, what are the difference, yeah, and then um how you select vendor, yeah. Yeah, and then this is that you know the, the, the different um this is um dynamic document, yeah? dynamic document from time to time you are going to update, yeah? and then uh, how do you consider your data storage tool, for example? Yeah, okay, uh, this is an example, okay. And then for example, how you choose your correct combination. So for example, for extraction data storage, what are the things that you want to choose? What are the criteria that you have to consider? Yeah? This is just using one. And then what are your enterprise architecture? This is example of enterprise architecture. You have to fit in you know, for your enterprise architecture. Yeah? Okay. Um, okay. And this is for, for example, uh, analytics modeling. Yeah. Uh, so this is guideline for, for example, component design. Yeah. Okay. So for example, descriptive, you want to use, actually we have more extended, but I'm not going to show Yeah. It's a lot. Yeah. Okay. For the different parts. Um, and then uh, this is evaluation metrics, how you want to evaluate, sorry. Um, evaluation metrics, yeah. Example of evaluation metrics, how you want to evaluate your data mining techniques, yeah. Okay, um, okay, then this is in terms of product development, yeah. For example, uh, for dashboard, what you have to consider and so on, yeah. Okay, so because of time limitation, I'm just going to finish off. So now, in conclusion, yeah. It, In conclusion, yeah. So data rise your decision. Don't just make decision based on intuition. Base it on data and rise the standard of your decision. Yeah. So you have to identify your pain points. Yeah. If you haven't measured it, it's time you measure it. Yeah. And then you, you know you will see that oh big data. I have to collect data from sources. No. Start from readily available data. 
then from time to time you can augment the data with other data to make better decision. Yeah. So do we need to invest in infrastructure? No. Leverage on the cloud first. Cloud is you pay as you want to use it. Yeah. Uh, then you know uh, the trend is going from higher computing power with much lower, cheaper price. Yeah. And then um, try to leverage on better analytics. Yeah? And then govern your data well. Yeah. Okay. And then I agree with Dr. Carl Ang yeah, from MDEC. Yeah. For us yeah, to democratize big data analytics in Malaysia, first you have to look at your infrastructure. Yeah, what is our open and shared data policy? A lot, if I want to discuss, but you can ask. Yeah, open and our shared data policy. Yeah, and then what is our education so that we can create more data scientists? Yeah, in terms of infrastructure, yeah, we have to create higher bandwidth at lower cost. For example, in terms of funding, we have to create fund. Yeah, uh, for big data projects and start up, uh, set, uh, start up. Yeah. In terms of regulation, we have to remove barrier to big data innovation and we have to provide guidelines to support big data uh, analytics in organization. Yeah. So I think that's the end. Yep. Okay, so you know many people yeah, have cooperated with me. Uh, in terms of all that I've presented, I thank my colleagues. Yeah, too many. Yeah, to mention. Yeah, um, Dr. Anazida, Dr. Chan, Dr. Sharin. You have been very, very helpful. Dr. Mashita and many others. Yeah, I'm sorry if I don't mention your name. Yeah, and my students. Yeah, my students and my research officers. These are my students. We have a lot of good times and a lot of drama. Yeah, uh, drama Aymate pun banyak. Yeah, a lot of uh, drama with my students. Like Professor Rose said, I have. How many? Eh? More than 43. 43 eh? St PhD students that have graduated under my supervision as the main supervisor. Yeah, These are all of them. They are now Deputy Vice Chancellor for Research and Innovation, yeah. deans, professors yeah? all over the world. And these are my current student and my you know, co-supervised student and my master's by research student. I thank my family. My, my parents, my siblings, my husband. Yeah, and my children and grandchildren yeah, for all the support that they have given me. Yeah. And to my three kindly sisters, Kola to Fatima, three kindly sisters, thank you for all the support that you have given me. Yeah. To everyone that have made this session, yeah, that have helped uh, make this session a reality. Thank you, and IT people, uh, Cik Salimi, uh, Jaya, Murli, yeah, uh, my PA, Asha, my RO, Fatima. And everyone here, uh, thank you all. May Allah uh, bless you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. That's all. I hope you um, get uh, some benefit here yeah, from what I presented. Uh, over to you, Dr. Anazida. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you, Prof. Alhamdulillah, thank you, Prof. Naomi, for enlightening us with the extraordinary journey uh, that you have gone through in digital transformation system and to face major challenges in big data analytics that can effectively provide valuable and actionable ideas. I believe that we are all inspired now seeing how you bring your research work to much greater height. Now, I would like to invite Professor Dr. Rosni Abdullah, who was formerly Dean at the School of Computer Science, University of Science Malaysia, or also known as USM, Okay, currently, Prof. Rosni is attached to the Academic and International Division, USM. Over to you, Prof. Thank you, Dr. Azanida. Assalamu alaikum and good afternoon to all present today. <clears throat> it is indeed an honor and privilege for me to review Professor Naomi's professorial inaugural lecture today. Thank you, Prof. Naomi, for inviting me to this auspicious event. Just like Prof. Rose Alinda, I also immediately said yes when you asked if I could be the reviewer for your professoral lecture. Congratulations, Prof. Naomi, for your very excellent achievement. And thank you for sharing the insightful lecture on turning data into insights, the challenges and promises of mining gold from data. Prof. Naomi has come a very long way with data, as she has shared with us earlier how she has dealt 
with data from the days of file processing to relational and object-oriented databases, to radiology images, to chemical databases, to biological databases, and finally, to big data analytics and deep learning. Somewhat similar to my own research path, where I have dealt with parallel processing power of supercomputers, to cluster computing, to grid computing, to multi-core computing, to GPGPU and quantum computing. High processing power alone without data is useless. And to process data, one needs computing power. When I ventured into biological data, that was when my path crossed with that of Professor Naomi. Since then, we started working together, particularly examining each other's students. I enjoyed examining her PhD students because their work is always very interesting. I also like to appoint Prof Naomi as external examiner to my students, not because I know her or because she's my friend, but because she's very thorough in examining and she always challenges the students and brings out the best from their work. And I always learn something new from Viva sessions with her. At this point, I also want to add that both of us, Professor Naomi and myself, obtained our master's program from the same university in the US. So coming back to her lecture, it is clear that data is everywhere in our lives. Data is being generated in huge amounts, even as we sit listening to this lecture. Today, we see data growing at an exponential rate, not just in one discipline, but in many disciplines. So that contributes to volume that she was telling us earlier. Data comes from various sources and that eludes the variety of data. And it is produced at a very fast rate that accounts for velocity. We want to obtain value from this huge amount of data. We want to uncover the gold from the data. The volume, the variety, and the velocity of data produced today makes it impossible to manage, process, and analyze using the traditional business intelligence tools. There is a need for the use of advanced analytics and intelligent methods to gain insights from this tsunami of data. What do we do with the insights from our data? We use it for decision-making. Prof Naomi has showed us several examples of how we can make decisions from insights obtained from the data. Companies and organizations today must move towards data-driven decision-making in order to remain competitive. Data-driven decision-making is a decision-making process which involves collecting data, extracting patterns and facts from that data, and utilizing those facts to make inferences that influence our decision-making. And as Prof Naomi has put it earlier, data rise your decisions. To be data-driven, an organization must be willing to act on the insights that has been obtained from the data, making decisions and predictions for the organization. We also saw earlier many of Prof Naomi's big data analytics work at UTM, which includes bioinformatics, chem informatics, tax and fin financial analytics, and social media analytics. She also showed us the projects on foreign worker impact analysis in Pengarang, the Mohi Data Warehouse, the UTM MMHE Integrated Mobile Ordering System, drug discovery through chem informatics, computer-aided drug design, which, are, which is really her forte, and, and many, many more that we saw, and that just shows us the richness of where data can be applied and analyzed. Eight data challenges were presented by Professor Naomi, which are data representation and modeling, comparing data, searching data, combining data, summarizing data, analyzing sentiments in data, ensuring quality of data, modeling and mining data for prediction. And she has also presented how the challenges were solved in her research work. It's very, very interesting and um, just amazing at the amount of work that she and her students have done. The highlight of her lecture is the ADIBA framework, 
which she is presenting for the first time today to public. The Adiba Big Data Adoption and Implementation Framework is a comprehensive framework from what I saw just now, which can help organizations in accelerating digital transformation, which will in turn facilitate them towards becoming a data-driven organization. It is hoped that Malaysia, currently being at level three in big data analytics maturity, will be able to move to a higher level with this framework, inshallah. In conclusion for today, after listening to Professor Naomi's inspiring profession, professorial lecture, I believe that it is fundamental to recognize that embracing a data-driven decision-making approach is about creating the right conditions within an organization to provide data-related leadership, develop talent, and build skills throughout the organization. There is a need to create a data culture within the organization for each employee at each level to be able to appreciate the data that they have and the potential insight that can be obtained from the data. This data culture encompasses values, behaviors, and attitudes of executives and employees alike that will promote and enable use of relevant data as the driving force of decision-making. Ultimately, it is about creating a data-driven culture where everyone understands the importance of collecting good data and has access to it to support enterprise decision-making. That ends my review for Professor Naomi's professional inaugural lecture. Thank you very much. I now hand over the session to Dr. Azanida. Thank you. Okay, Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Thank you, Prof. Uh, Rosni, for the excellent review. Now, I would like to pick some questions posted in the Facebook and also YouTube. Uh, due to time constraint, because I've seen there are quite a number of questions being posted in both platforms. Uh, but due to uh, time constraint, perhaps I can only take a few questions. Okay, uh, let us have a uh, first question, uh, technical team. Okay, we have uh, a question from Aklima from the Facebook. Okay, let me read the question. How can big data be beneficial to young companies opposed to well-established companies which already held a large amount of data? Um, okay, um, assalamualaikum. Um, okay, um, if we compare young companies with established company, maybe, maybe the established company have, um, you know, accumulated a lot more data than the young companies. But let's look at, you know, uh, it from a different angle. Yeah, yes, you can collect data, you can collect a large amount of data, but how do you use the data? Yeah, in many well-established companies, they have this culture. Maybe they are used, you know, the position holder are used to making decision based on their intuition. Yeah, based on you know, um, maybe some some reasons. Yeah, some reasons. Yeah, um, they prefer yeah to make decision based on intuition rather than using the data. So, um, changing that culture can be a challenge. Yeah. As opposed to young companies, yeah, you start, you know, from, you know, maybe because you are young, yeah, you are more agile and more flexible in terms of how you make decisions, in terms of how you make use of the data. Now, you may have other challenges. For example, you have not accumulated you know, large enough data. But yeah, in uh, today's world, that is not a big problem. Yeah? you can start uh, making use of what data is available. No need to think of data that, uh, that requires you a lot of investment to obtain the data. Yeah? Start with whatever you have first. Yeah? And then for you to analyze, start with whatever you have. Now there are more and more what we call self-serve um, analytics, self-serve platform and infrastructure. Yeah? Um, so, so you don't even have to have you know, very good data scientists, you know, well-trained data scientists, to um, get benefit from your data. Yeah? 
And do you have to invest a lot? Maybe if, as a young company, you might not have a large capital to invest on large infrastructure uh, for performing your big data analytics. Yeah, but now you can leverage on the cloud, for example, where you only pay for the thing that you use. Yeah. So now as a young company, you, you can think, okay, what are the things that is, um, you know, your pain points? What are the things that, you know, if you do it, you know, by optimize, by, by using your data, you can get the highest value for your company in terms of competition and so on. For example, startup, you know, now they are you know, platform businesses. Yeah, platform businesses. Our country, um, maybe, you know, like, is not as fast as, for example, Singapore or US. Yeah, in terms of, you know, this um, platform-based companies. Yeah. Uh, so maybe you can look at that, you know, and then, you know, uh, start, you know, um, capitalizing on the data that you can crawl from the internet, for example, and look at, you know, um, how you can benefit from this data to place your young company yeah, in um, the competitive world of this, um, you know, this sort of companies that make this sort of businesses. Yeah, so I don't think yeah, that it's not beneficial. In fact, you can get a lot of benefit because of your flexibility and agility, uh, agility yeah, compared to some uh, well-established companies. I hope that answers your question. Okay, thank, thank you, Prof. Nomi. Uh, we have the second question. Okay, actually, uh, we have compiled. There are three questions which are under the same umbrella, I would call it, because they are talking about awareness and also the mature, uh, awareness and also the privacy. So these are the two issues that I think um, can hinder the growth in uh, data analytics or uh, big data research. Okay, so the first question comes from Nur Lizawati Ramli. Uh, the question is, what will happen to data privacy then? Okay, uh, perhaps we can go to the second question. Okay, the sec second question comes from Siti Diana, also got to do with uh, uh, privacy. How about data analytics that can increase the future of education prof? In Malaysia, the data is still difficult to assess due to awareness and privacy issues. So what is your opinion on this? And the final question, which is also got to do with a uh, privacy issue. Okay, this comes uh, from Dr. Ivy Tan. Dear Prof Naomi, Thank you very much for your sharing. Would you share more on the risk of big data analytics? What are the ways uh, to minimize the potential risk and increase ethical responsibilities among business entities or, or also uh, the developers? Okay, uh, you can proceed. Okay, um, uh, thank you, Dr. Azinda and um, all, um, all, all the uh, uh, spectators, participants who have asked questions. Okay, in terms, okay, many people think eh, um, we have problems in sharing of data because of privacy. I will give one example. We are doing talent analytics, yeah, where um, I said that, you know, um, we are not uh, only getting data, you know, from our legacy databases, but also we want to crawl. So is it ethical if we do that? Is it ethical if we do that? You know, do we encroach certain privacy um, issues? Yeah, you know, when we do that, yeah, okay. Um, when we are dealing with issues such as privacy, for example, eh, one thing you have to know is like this, yeah. Um, if we need to use data, we need not, you know, uh, have the whole set of the, the data, yeah, for it to be useful. For example, yeah, you want to find out how, you know, what are the best product that you want to market to a certain person yeah, based on a certain, um, you know, um, based on certain persona that people have collected, eh, the data, I said uh, data as a service. Yeah. Do I need to get, you know, what is the name, the IC number of that person? No need, yeah. What you have to do is, you know, like you group it into, oh, this kind of uh, people, for example, this kind of gender with this age, you know, with this um, job, for example, yeah, what they do, you know, like you, then you can compare in terms of the jobs, you know, and the uh, the jobs or the gender or the age group of the people. You know? So you need not get the real, you know, the whole set of things, yeah, uh, the whole set of data, yeah, but just enough aggregate aggregated data that help you make the decision. Okay, one more thing, yeah, that is important, yeah. 
before we talk about, you know, we also have problem, you know, like for example, um, when we want to predict COVID, when it will end, how many PPEs we need, you know, um, when the business can start operate, you know, um, many people maybe are reluctant before this to share data from, for example, my suggestion for our group to make prediction, for example, yeah. But we have to you know for us to deal with this kind of issue. First, we have to have the principle in place. Do we have the principle in place? What is the principle of data sharing? What is the principle of privacy? Yeah. What is private? What is not private? What can be shared? What are the principle that says you know certain benefit outweighs you know certain risks, and we have to do it for the sake of you know well being of our country. Principle in place. After we have certain principle outlined, yeah, okay, for example, this kind of thing we cannot disclose and so on. We based on the principle, we make the policy based on the principle. So what are the policy? Is there any policy on privacy for certain things? Yeah, and maybe you have to refer to certain you know regulation and so on. So principles, then policy, then only you can have guidelines to allow data analysts, data scientists to use data that is allowable for them without encroaching privacy issues or certain security issues and so on. So this thing needs to be in place. Yeah? Same thing with ethics, yeah, Dr. Ivy. Same things with ethics. What is the principle? Principles. Then what is the policy yeah, to uphold that principle? That principles? And then what are the guidelines for people to leverage on the data? If we don't have principle, clear principle, clear policy, you know, then we can say, oh, simply cannot share, simply cannot share. Then we use, you know, we lose a lot of values that we can get from the data because of not having the principle and the policy in the first place. This is my opinion. Yeah. So, and then we have this ethic committee, you know, many ethic committees. So the ethic committee have to come up with principle first, not, not uh, something ad hoc, you know, based on what you face daily, not ad hoc. Principle, then we all go by the principle and the policy. Yeah, you have to have guidelines that help people like us who analyze data, yeah, um, for, you know, to get more values from the data. Yeah, uh, so so this is what I think should be in place. I hope it answers all the questions I, you know. Okay, thank you, bro. Okay, can we have a technical thing? Can we have the next question? Okay, this question is quite long. Okay, um, yeah, okay, let's read it. Okay, this comes from uh, Dr. Adinan Hassan. Okay, uh, in manufacturing organizations, planning for materials capacity and other resources requirements are normally done through material resource planning or MRP system, which later evolve into ERP or enterprise resource planning, where MRP integrates with other functions in organizations. Considering the ERP is a collection of functional data related to manufacturing and other business operations, how big data play a role in ERP system? Okay, so I'll proceed with the next question because it's quite uh, similar to it. It's actually the continuation of it. So if the company is interested uh, to implement uh, the uh, big data, any guideline for industries to make decisions? whether should they adopt the off-the-shelf, which is the ERP system, or develop in-house or subscribe to cloud-based system or cloud ERP. So uh, there are two okay. parts. Yeah. Okay, let, let me answer the first question first. By having your ERP, yeah, you have a lot of data already about your supply chain, about your production and so on. And there are many decisions eh, that you can make from the data that you have collected through your ERP system. You know, for example, about product life cycle, you know, analytics, eh? not, I'm, I'm not talking, there are big data and big data analytics. Yeah? So from the data that you have collected from your ERP, there are a lot of decisions that you can do. Yeah? For example, you know, um, which machine produce, you know, um, which machine is uh, could be problematic in um, a one year time, you know, uh, you know, how you optimize your workforce, you know, what are the best supplier for this kind of material and so on. There are a lot of data that you can use, yeah. But when we talk about big data, yeah, and, you know, to make better decisions, you know, for example, understanding your competition, you know, 
you have to augment the data from the external sources yeah, with the data that you have collected through your ERP system. And then you can make better analytics, for example, in understanding the environment, the demand, in designing new products, yeah, and in designing the processes that can um, best uh, be used to produce the product. Yeah. So, you know, good. Yeah. ERP is good. Yeah. You can leverage on that first. But, you know, for you to get higher value, I think you have to look outside the, um, your organization, outside the ERP system, yeah, and see how you can augment, you know, or you, you can complement the data in, uh, that is produced through your ERP system to get better values and better insights about what is happening, yeah. Because I believe for organization, not only you have to look inside, yeah, but you have to compare it with what is happening in the environment regarding your competitors, your customer, and so on. Otherwise, you know, you might lose the game in the long run. Okay, for your second question, yeah? So if you want to implement big data, you know, what do you use, you know, off the shelf, in-house, yeah, uh, or cloud, yeah? So it depends, first, maybe on your budget, yeah? Um, what budget you have, yeah? And then it also depends on your goals. For example, yeah? If um, you, you know, what you, you know, maybe, you know, off the shelf is better, yeah, because of its comprehensiveness, because it's already there and normally it's customizable to what you need. Yeah? But if you, what you want is something that is very unique and cannot be provided by off the shelf software, yeah, you might want to develop it on your own, yeah? especially in the case where you, have, you want to build um, your own, you know, you, you want to develop your own talent. Yeah, in terms of big data analytics. And if you do that, maybe it's easier for you. Yeah? You, know, you have to think of other uh, value pools, yeah? other, um, other value pool for your company. In case later, yeah, you want to sell off the solution to other companies, then that will be a potential revenue generating, uh, revenue generating uh, source for your company. Yeah? Especially you want to be in-house. Yeah? But in case you don't have, yeah, and in case you don't have budget for, to buy off the shelf, then cloud-based is a very good option for you to use. Because for cloud, you only use as you need. Maybe you start small, yeah, then as time goes by, yeah, you can, um, you, you can, uh, you know, like, it, like you can um, go on to um, acquiring more yeah, from the cloud. And in fact, now, like I said, yeah, now people are going through hybrid cloud. I mean that you can hybrid what is offered in the cloud and on-prem uh, infrastructure, yeah, and also uh, software, yeah. Okay. Um, I hope I answered the questions. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Prof. Uh, because we have time constraint, it's already four forty-five. Uh, this will be the last question that I can take. Okay. Uh, the question comes from Muhammad Haris. Okay. Okay, uh, we start the question with, okay, thank you, Prof. For such a detailed and amazing presentation, I have a question in the idea plagiarism detection. Uh, the machine learning algorithms perform better as compared to the traditional algorithms. But the idea we have in machine learning is about 10 times costly in terms of computation. Does it help to transform from traditional approaches for idea plagiarism detection using machine learning for deep learning? I, I think he's yeah. talking fast. Yeah. Okay, but more on our idea plagiarism detection software and uh, solutions. Yeah. Okay, what we do is we train our machine learning algorithm based on, you know, for our case, you know, um, there is not so much corpus out there yeah, because most corpus are quite traditional in how, you know, are quite traditional and we cannot train because ours is new idea plagiarism. Yeah, so it's, you know, we have to have our own corpus to train our algorithm. So what we do is, you know, we take, you know, like um, the benchmark database on plagiarism. Yeah, we also uh, create our own corpus yeah, for training our algorithm. For example, yeah, um, for example, I, eat, uh, I drive car, car driven by me. So we generate it through computer. Yeah, or we change, yeah? I drive car, I drive motor car. We use WordNet to blow up, you know, um, our, our, our our corpus, and then we pay people. You know, for example, for certain types, then we pay people, yeah, to create more and more of different types of plagiarism that they can think of, yeah. 
So when you say it's expensive, in the beginning, yes, it's expensive because we have to collect the data, we have to pay people to train our machine learning algorithm. But after we train it, after we train it, yeah, then we can, you know, uh, after we train it, then you can use it. No need to train again. It is very fast. In terms, what, what course are you talking about in terms of computational complexity? Yeah, because after you train, yeah, you can use it. The training takes time, but the using, yeah, when, when you use the the machine learning uh, algorithm that you have trained is is quite cheap, you know, in, in my opinion. Yeah. Um. So. You know, like uh, that's why uh, we think it's feasible, yeah, um, to use um, our machine learning algorithm for detecting idea parallelism. Yeah, so the cost is only at the beginning when you want to devise the algorithm. Yeah, um, um, as you can see, it was the end of my presentation. I talked about concept drift. Yeah, and one of our one of our work is on the difference in the concept drift in terms of classification. Uh, Classification algorithm in terms of machine learning, eh, classifier. Uh, so that is a challenge. For example, human, you know, they evolve. You know, one time they do they, when they know that we can detect, they do different things. Uh, so that is also a way on how to detect concept drift. You know, how to detect the uh, how to detect whether your uh, classifier is versatile enough uh, based on the data set that you have. You know, when you want to put it into operation or test. So when you see there is a drift and your classifier is out, you know, by time, then there is a way for you to detect, you know, using um, one of my work, I showed it just now, eh? detect whether there is a drift in terms of your classifier training and you can actually assemble, you know, a, a new classifier together with your old classifier. But if you cannot work with the traditionals, you know, and it defeats the purpose of preserving integrity of uh, universities, you know, uh, protecting your intellectual right. No? So this is the path that we need to take, yeah, in my opinion. Okay. Okay, okay. Thank you, technical. Thank you, technical team. Okay, uh, so with that, that, that was the last question because we don't have time. Uh, all, all other questions that you posted in FB, inshallah, uh, Prof. Naomi will answer those questions. So please check this post out in your uh, Facebook. So now we come to the ending <laughs> section of the event. Okay. Uh, so with the answer to the last question uh, from Prof. Naomi, I hope everyone are satisfied Okay, with the answer. Um, the is that if I may interrupt, if I may interrupt, uh, we have a um, questionnaire about Adiba. So in case your company would want to use Adiba, or you want to help us validate Adiba, we are going to call up a workshop and you will be able to share and we are going to look at it into more detail. And if you want to use it, you know, um, we have had a number of companies and organizations using it right now. Yeah, um, we are in discussion with some other companies. But if you want to be, you know, with us, because this will be helpful for our country. So please fill in the um, survey form, yeah, survey form posted on FB and YouTube, yeah, so that we can uh, contact you. Yeah, um, to be involved in the development of Adiba for the benefit of our country. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> yeah, please uh, grab this opportunity because Adiba, I've seen the Adiba framework. It's a great framework. So please be part of the Adiba. Okay, thank you, Prof. Okay, so finally, we have reached uh, to the end of today's program. A huge congratulations to Prof. Naomi for her success and thanks for the wonderful lecture. Uh, I also want to thank our chairman and the reviewer, Dr. Rus Alinda. I think you can see her now <laughs> in the car driving to. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And also, uh, uh, and also Prof. Dr. Rosni Abdullah. Okay. Thank you very much to two, you know, uh, very, you know, uh, to me, these figures that, that uh, participate in this particular event. They are all great scholars, okay? So they are my idols, okay? And also, much appreciation uh, to the organizer and committee who have worked very hard to realize this event. And not forgotten, thank you very much also to all viewers for staying tuned with us within these two, two and a half hours. Alhamdulillah, uh, we have reached actually uh, 1.2K or 1,200 engagement 
a huge congratu congratulations to us too. And we have about 2,000 views. Again, thank you and we are grateful for your participation. Before we leave, let's, us, uh, let's recite Tasbih Kifarah and Surah Al-Asr as we seek for Allah's mercy and forgiveness for our mistakes and sins. Subhanakallahumma bihamdika ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik. Okay, see you, see you in another lecture series uh, by UTM and Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh and stay safe. Okay, bye everyone. Hey. Um.